Incidentally, both procedures can be combined to create something new and really stunning. If you put pieces of rye bread into a pot and pour in a bottle of vodka over it, you produce an original dish called the tura, a combination of drinking and eating. The fanciers of Tura are basically Siberians and the military, thereby attaining an amazing effect. Intoxication after a bottle of vodka poured onto bread and eaten with a spoon is the same as drinking two or three bottles from a glass. So Tura is a dish for those strong in spirit. Our conversation is with Mr. Yuri Alexandrovich Bezmianov. Mr. Bezmianov was born in 1939 in a suburb of Moscow. He was the son of a high-ranking Soviet Army officer. He had an outstanding career with Novosti, which was the, and still is, I should say, the press arm or the press agency of the Soviet Union. It turns out that this is also a front for the KGB. One of his interesting assignments was to brainwash foreign diplomats when they visited Moscow. And he'll tell us a little bit about how they did this and how they planted information which eventually wound up in the press of the free world. This is the first stage of befriending a professor. You can see myself on the left with the same James Bond smile. On, my, on the right is my KGB supervisor, Comrade Leonid Mitrokhin, and in the middle a professor of political science in Delhi University. The next stage would be to invite him to a gathering of in the Soviet Friendship Society. There he is sitting next to his wife before he is being sent to USSR for a free trip. Everything is paid by the Soviet government. He was made to believe that he is invited to USSR because he is a talented, sober thinking intellectual. Absolutely false. He is invited because he is a useful idiot, because he would agree and subscribe to most of the Soviet propaganda cliché and when he is coming back to, to his own country, he is going for years and years to teach the beauties of Soviet socialism to uh, newer and newer generations of his students, thus promoting the Soviet propaganda line. In 1967, the KGB attached me to this magazine, Look Magazine. A group of 12 people arrived to USSR from the United States to cover the 50th anniversary of October socialist revolution in my country. Uh, most of them pretended they don't understand that uh, we are actually working on behalf of the Soviet government and the KGB. They pretended that they are actually being guests, a VIP intellectuals, that they are treated according to their merits and, and, and their intellectual abilities. For us, they were just a bunch of political prostitutes to be taken advantage for various propaganda operations. This is how a, a typical uh, conference in Novosti headquarters in Moscow look like. The pay special attention to number of bottles on the table. This is one of the ways to kill the awareness or curiosity of, of foreign journalists. My, one of my functions was to keep foreign guests permanently intoxicated the moment they land at Moscow airport. I had to take them to the VIP lounge and toast to friendship and understanding between the nations of the world, glass of vodka, then the second glass of vodka. And in no time, my guests would be feeling very happy. They would see everything in kind of pink, nice color. And uh, that's the way I, I had to keep them permanently for the next 15 or, or 20 days. At certain point in time, I had to withdraw alcohol from them so that some of them who are the most recruitable would feel a little bit shaky guilty trying to remember what they were talking last night 
that's the time to approach them with all kind of nonsense such as joint communique or statement for, for Soviet propaganda. Uh, that's the time they are the most flexible. And of course, what they didn't understand, myself, who was drinking together with them, uh, was not drinking at all. I had ways to get rid of alcohol through various techniques, including special pills which were given to me by my colleagues. Uh, but they were taking it seriously. In other words, they, they, they would consume quite a large volumes of alcohol and feel quite uneasy next morning. And I agree with the mayor. I, I can't agree more with the surprise of the civility and the kindness of the people we met. I, I feel like we met our counterparts. I, a little bit louder. I, I felt more comfortable with those people than any other European country I'd been in. I felt like I'd found cousins or uncles or grandparents there. They, they treated us uh, royally is probably the wrong word, but <laughs> <laughs> they treated us very, very, very well. I know that John Franco has in front of them a copy of the Moscow News, uh, which is a publication that comes out in English, French, and a few other languages, including, I believe, Russian, which has some self-criticism and some debate, which is extraordinarily interesting and surprised many of us uh, very much. When we flew from Moscow to Leningrad the first weekend we were there, we picked up a copy of this newspaper called Moscow News. Uh, and we were frankly uh, flabbergasted at the level of debate and criticism that's going on in this newspaper uh, about their society. From the first page to the last page, it was a package of lies, propaganda cliché, which were presented to American readers as opinions. They were not opinions at all. Uh, they were the clichés which the Soviet propaganda wants American public to think that they think. I was surprised by the degree of self-criticism uh, which Soviet officials uh, were prepared to make about their own society. Uh, frankly, I thought that they would be there to tell us that everything is, is wonderful, and that certainly was not the case. Uh, for example, they are absolutely open in acknowledging that they are not a democratic society. From the viewpoint of the Soviet propaganda, although there are some subtle criticism of the Soviet system, the basic message is that Russia today is a nice, functioning, efficient system supported by majority of population. That's the biggest lie. I think it's also fair to point out that when we were in Moscow, for example, I think most of the people here also were extremely impressed by their public transportation system. In fact, it was the cleanest, most effective mass transit system that I've ever seen in my life. They move six million people a day. You wait 15 seconds in rush hour between one train and another. The stations themselves were absolutely beautiful, uh, in, including many works of art, chandeliers that were beautiful. It was a very, very effective system. They found all kinds of justifications for telling lies to American public. Um, this and, is excuse me, it was partly your job to make sure that they got these ideas yes. and accepted them as their own ideas. Right. Also, I was impressed by the youth programs that they have, uh, their palaces of, of, of culture for, for the young people, a whole variety of, young, uh, of programs for young people, and cultural programs which go far beyond what we do in this country. This, for example, is a centerfold of the, of, of the Look magazine. They presented this monument erected by Communist Party in Stalingrad as the symbol, personification of Russian military might. And they said in the article which is published on, on the side that Soviets are very proud of the victory in the Second World War. This is another big myth, a lie. One uh, visit that we took as a group that was quite compelling was uh, at the Leningrad Cemetery. Um, and we learned about the siege at Leningrad during World War II. And some of us were familiar with it to a to an extent, but it was very a very moving um, tour. No sensible people would be proud to lose 20 millions of their countrymen in a war which was started by Genosse Hitler and Comrade Stalin and paid by American multinationals. Um, the Leningrad memorial we visited, I think, was probably one of the more moving experiences of my life. Uh, most Americans forget that part of the history of World War II. The Soviets lost more people killed by famine and starvation and bombs due to the Nazis 
in that one city than all of the Americans who died in the entire war. That one city lost over a half million people. Most of the Soviet citizens look at this type of monuments with disgust and sorrow because every family lost father, brother, sister, or child in the Second World War. We looked at the uh, diary of a little girl who lived in Leningrad at the time, talking, you know, on this page it says, today my mother died, a few pages later my brother died, a few pages later my cousin died. And finally, after several pages, nobody's left but me. And there was not a, a dry eye in anybody in the museum. But uh, I presume that many Americans, millions of Americans who were reading Look magazine at that time, had absolutely wrong idea about the sentiments of my nation, about what the Soviets are proud of and what they hate. Uh, many, many guests from various countries were taken by me as a Novosti Press Agency employee uh, for a tour across Siberia, for example. We would show them typical kindergarten, you see, nothing special by American standards, just nice children sitting, eating their breakfast or, or lunch. Um, what they could not understand, or they pretended not to understand, that this is an exemplary kindergarten. This is not the kindergarten for average person or average family in USSR. And we maintain that illusion in their minds. You can see myself under the red spot in the middle there uh, with the same business-like expression. I'm, on, you know, I'm doing my job. That, that's what I'm assigned to do and that's what I was paid to do. But deep inside, I still hope that at least some of these useful idiots would understand that what they are looking at has nothing to do with the level of affluence in my nation. Um, yeah, when it, you know, push comes to shove, I would rather live here. But in terms of where I want my children to live, I'm not sure. <laughs> and I left feeling like that. I left feeling like, oh, I want this education. I want to know all, all of this that, that I don't have a handle on yet. This is a better picture which reflects the true spirit of, of the Soviet, chi uh, ch Soviet childhood. This picture was printed in a Canadian government publication by mistake. In the middle, you can see children playing on a, sm a small courtyard, and the caption goes, this is a typical kindergarten in Siberia. What these idiots didn't understand, that it is not kindergarten at all. It is a prison for children of political prisoners. School was out of session when we were there. I mean, it's their summertime, too. So, but actually, they were taking exams at that point. Um, so we, we didn't get to see classrooms. But when we, we did, we were walking along the street and we saw a school and said, oh, let's go in. So we took some steps and just, you know, walked right into the school and, sit and told them who we were and we were greeted like, oh, come on in, we'll show you around. And I think what was most exciting about that is we were not only met with the, with the teachers, but the students were there also to show us around and they, they were dressed in work clothes for that day. And I guess um, in reading some about it, there aren't any janitors in the school that the are all part of the staff that maintains the building. So that's what they were doing that day. Um, they showed us their, their newspaper, you know, up on the wall, which was, you know, it was, you know, beautiful. I have, I have some videos of that, too, that at some point I'll, you know, pull together so people can see it. And the job of people like myself to help them to n not to notice that they are actually talking to prisoners. Most of the children were dressed, especially on the occasion of the foreigner's visit, uh, the, uh, of course, there were no corpses in, on the ground, there were no machine gun guards, and uh, the, well, it looks not very pleasant, as you see. It's a, it, it looks dull, but obviously it does not create an impression that this is actually a prison. Well, did any of the journalists have the uh, curiosity to ask about uh, prisons and that kind of thing? Yes. They were in Siberia, this yes. is what you associate. Some of, yes, some of them asked questions and naturally we, we would give them, the, for the stupid question, we give them stupid answer. No, there are no prisons in Siberia. No, most of the people who, are, who you see are free citizens of USSR. They are very happy to be here uh, and, and they are contributing to the glory of the socialist system. This is exactly what the KGB and Marxist-Leninist propaganda wants from Americans, to distract their uh, opinion, uh, attention, and mental energy from real issues of the United States into a non-issues, into a non-world, non-existent uh, harmony. 
Obviously, it's more beneficial for the Soviet aggressors to have a bunch of duped Americans than Americans who are self-conscious, healthy, uh, physically fit, and alert to, to the reality. He obviously is not on the payroll of the KGB. But w whether he knows it or not, he contributes greatly to demoralization of American society. And he's not the only one. To my horror, I discovered that in the files where people were doomed to execution, there were names of, of pro-Soviet journalists with whom I was personally friendly. Pro-Soviet? Yes. They were idealistically minded <laughs> leftists who uh, made several visits to USSR. And yet, the KGB decided that come revolution or drastic changes in political structure of India, they will have to go. Why is that? Because th they know too much. Simply because, you see, the useful idiots, the, the leftists who are idealistically believing in the beauty of Soviet socialist or communist or whatever system, when they get disillusioned, they become the worst enemies. That's why my KGB instructors specifically made the point, never bother with leftists. Forget about these political prostitutes. Aim higher. But or, to eliminate the others, to execute the others, don't they serve some purpose? Wouldn't they be no, the ones they, they rely they on? they serve purpose only at the stage of destabilization of a nation. For example, your leftists in, in United States, all these professors and all these beautiful civil rights defenders, they are instrumental in the process of the, of the uh, uh, subversion only to destabilize the nation. When their job is completed, they are, non, they are not needed anymore. They know too much. Some of them, when, when they get disillusioned, when they see that Marxist-Lenin has come to power, the, obviously they get offended. They think that they will come to power. That will never happen, of course. They will be lined up against the wall and shot. And that's what happened in Nicaragua. It happened in, in uh, uh, Grenada. Same happened in Afghanistan. Same happened in, in Bangladesh. It's the same pattern everywhere. The moment they serve their purpose, all the useful idiots are used, either be executed entirely, all the idealistically minded Marxists, or uh, uh, exiled or put in prisons, like in Cuba. Many, many former Marxists are in Cuba, I mean in prison. So most of the Indians who were cooperating with the Soviets, especially without the uh, uh, Department of, of uh, Information of the USSR embassy, were listed for execution. Well, you spoke several times before about ideological subversion. That is a phrase that uh, I'm afraid some Americans don't fully understand. When uh, the Soviets use the phrase ideological subversion, what do they mean by it? What it basically means is to change the perception of reality of every American to such an extent that despite of the abundance of information, no one is able to come to sensible conclusions in the interest of defending themselves, their families, their community, and their country. It's a great brainwashing uh, process, which goes very slow, and it's divided in, in four basic stages. Uh, the first one being demoralization. It takes from 15 to 20 years to demoralize a nation. Why that many years? Because this is the minimum number of years which requires to uh, educate one generation of students, in the country of, of, of your enemy, exposed to the ideology of the enemy. In other words, Marxism-Leninism ideology is being pumped into the soft heads of, of, of at least three generations of American students without being challenged or counterbalanced by the basic values of Americanism, American patriotism. The result, the result you can see, most of the people who graduated in the 60s, dropouts or half-baked intellectuals, are now occupying the positions of power in the government, civil service, business, mass media, educational system. You are stuck with them. You cannot get rid of them. They are contaminated. They are programmed to think and react to certain stimuli in a certain pattern. You cannot change their mind. Even if you, if you expose them to authentic information, even if you prove that white is white and black is, uh, is black, you still cannot change the basic perception and the logic of behavior. In other words, these people, uh, uh, the process of demoralization is complete and irreversible. To get rid of society of these people, you, have, you need another 20 or, or, or 15 years to educate a new generation of patriotically minded and, and, and uh, common, common sense 
people who would be acting in favor and in the interests of, of, the, uh, of the United States society. And yet these people who've been programmed and, as you say, in place and yes. who are favorable to an opening with the Soviet concept, mm -hmm. these are the very people who would be marked for extermination in this country? Most of them, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, simply because the psychological shock when, when they will see in future what the, what the beautiful society of equality and social justice means in practice, Obviously, they will revolt. They 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 will uh, they they will be very unhappy, frustrated people. And the Marxist-Leninist regime does not tolerate these people. Uh, they obviously they will join the links of dissenters, mm -hmm. dissidents. Yes. Uh, unlike in present United States, there will be no place for dissent in in future Marxist-Leninist America. In future, these people will be simply squashed like cockroaches. Nobody is going to pay them nothing for their beautiful, noble ideas of equality. This they don't understand, and uh, it will be the greatest shock for them, of course. As I mentioned before, uh, exposure to true information does not matter anymore. A person who was demoralized is unable to assess true information. The facts tell nothing to him. Uh, even if I shower him with information, with, with authentic proof, with documents, with pictures, even if I take him by force to the Soviet Union and show him concentration camp, he will refuse to believe it until he, he is going to receive a kick in, the, in his fat bottom. When a military boot crashes his balls, then he will understand, but not before that. That's the tragic of the situation of demoralization. The next stage is destabilization. This time, subverter does not care about your ideas and the patterns of your consumption. Whether you eat junk food and get fat and flab, it doesn't matter anymore. This time, and it takes only from two to five years to destabilize a nation, uh, it's, what, what matters is essentials, economy, foreign relations, defense systems. Uh, and you can see it quite clearly that in some areas, uh, in such sensitive areas as, as uh, defense, an economy, uh, the uh, influence of Marxist-Leninist ideas in the United States is absolutely fantastic. I, I could never believe it 14 years ago when I landed uh, in this part of the world that the process will go that fast. Uh, the next stage, of course, is crisis. It, it, it may take only up to six weeks to, to bring a country to the verge of crisis. This is what will happen in the United States if you allow all these schmucks to bring the country to crisis to promise people all kinds of goodies and the paradise on earth, uh, to, to destabilize your uh, economy, to eliminate the principle of free market competition, and to put a big brother government in Washington, D.C., with uh, benevolent dictators like Walter Mondale, who will promise lots of things, never mind whether the promises are fulfillable or not. He will create false illusions that the uh, situation is under control. Situation is not under control. Situation is disgustingly out of control. Most of the American politicians, media and educational system trains another generation of people who think they are living at a peacetime. False. United States is in a state of war. Undeclared total war against the basic principles and the foundations of, of this system. And, and the initiator of this war is not Comrade Andropov, of course. Uh, it's, it's the system, however ridiculous it may sound, the world communist system or the world communist conspiracy. Whether I scare some people or not, I don't give a hoot. Uh, if, if you are not scared by now, nothing can scare you. But you don't have to be paranoid about it. What, what actually happens now, that unlike myself, you have literally several years to live on unless the United States wake up. The, the time bomb is ticking with every second. The disaster is coming closer and closer. Unlike myself, you will have nowhere to defect to unless you want to live in Antarctica with penguins. This is it. This is the last country of freedom and, and possibility. Okay, so what do we do? What is your recommendation to the American people? Well, uh, the... Uh, the um, the immediate thing that comes to my mind is, of course, there must be a very strong 
national effort to educate people in, in, in the spirit of real patriotism, number one. Number two, to, to explain them the real danger of socialist, communist, whatever, welfare state, big brother government. If people will fail to grasp the impending danger of that development, nothing ever can help the United States. You may kiss goodbye to your freedom, including freedoms to, to homosexuals, to uh, prison inmates. All these freedoms will vanish, evaporate in, in five seconds, including your precious lives. Maybe two simplistic answers or solutions, but never, nevertheless, they are the only solutions. Educate yourself. Understand what's going on around you. You are not living at the time of peace. You are in a state of war. And you have precious little time to save yourself. It's, it's simplistic. I know it sounds unpleasant. I know Americans don't like to listen to things which are unpleasant. But I have defected not to tell you the stories about such idiocy as, as microfilm, James Bond type, espionage. This is garbage. Uh, you don't need any espionage anymore. I have come to talk about survival. It's a question of survival of this system. Um, you may ask me, what is it in for me? Survival, obviously, because unlike, I, as I said, I am now in your boat. If, if we sing together, we'll sing beautifully together. There is no other place on this planet to defect to.